Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 122. We've got a longtime CSP athlete. I've actually known him since he was a sophomore in high school. He's now in the big leagues. And this is actually an episode that I could have recorded a long time ago, but I wanted to wait it out just because I think uh, that recording it now probably gives him an opportunity to deliver a, a few more lessons. Now he's going through some different stuff and, and kind of picked up some different pearls of wisdom along the way. So just a really good interview from a wonderful guy I've known for a really long time. And I think I was um, you know, probably uniquely positioned to ask some questions that other folks might not think to ask, and hopefully you all benefit from it. So enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens, the most comprehensive NSF certified for sport daily nutritional supplement I've ever tried. With so many stressors in life, it's difficult to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our bodies the nutrients they need to thrive. As a father of three young kids and a co-founder of multiple businesses in multiple states, on top of still being an avid exerciser, I know that busy schedules can really take their toll on us. Whether it's poor sleep, exercise or life stressors, environmental factors, or simply not eating enough of the right foods, we can wind up deficient nutritionally. This is where Athletic Greens can really help. It's a game-changing nutritional insurance policy. They simplify the logistics of getting optimal nutrition on a daily basis by giving you just one thing with all the best things. And that's why I use it daily and recommend it to our athletes. One scoop of Athletic Greens contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more. They work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, increase energy and focus, aid in digestion, recovery, and supporting of a healthy immune system. This all can happen without taking multiple products. While most nutritional products come to market and stay stagnant, Athletic Greens continues to obsessively improve this one holistic formula based on the latest research, producing 53 improvements over the last decade. They invest in the most absorbable and natural source of each ingredient and go above and beyond in third-party testing to ensure their customers continue to receive the highest quality and best daily nutritional habit on the planet. It's lifestyle friendly whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free and contains less than one gram of sugar without compromising on taste. They put 75 ingredients to the NSF for Sport certification to come up with a formula that's trusted by some of the world's best athletes, including our own. Right now, Athletic Greens is giving our listeners 10 free travel packets with their subscription. Simply go to athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy to receive my offer. These travel packs are perfect for supporting your immune system, energy, and gut health when you're traveling for games, training, or simply when you're on the go. They can be a great counterbalance to less than ideal on the road food options. So if you want to bridge the gap between deficient and optimal and give yourself the best chance to get nutrient diversity, then head to athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy and get your 10 free travel packets today. Again, that's athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y. Today's guest is a right-handed pitcher who grew up in Auburn, Massachusetts. In 2009, as a sophomore, he helped them win the Division II state title as he went 7-1 with a .88 ERA with 114 strikeouts in 56 innings. He then transferred to Lawrence Academy in Groton, Massachusetts. In his senior year, he went 8-0 with a .69 ERA, 102 strikeouts, 8 walks, and 13 hits allowed in 51 innings. The Toronto Blue Jays selected him in the first round with the 21st overall selection of the 2011 MLB Draft. However, he decided not to sign, opting instead to attend Vanderbilt University to play baseball. He started his sophomore season in 2013, winning his first 14 starts and finished the season 14-1, leading the Southeastern Conference in wins and setting a school record along the way. He had a 2.32 ERA, 103 strikeouts in 101 innings, and 5.9 hits per nine innings allowed. He was one of three finalists for the Golden Spikes Award and a finalist for the Dick Hauser Trophy. After the season, he was selected by Team USA to play for their national team during the summer. As a junior in 2014, he had 116 strikeouts in 113 innings and helped Vanderbilt win the College World Series. He was drafted with the 14th overall pick in the 2014 MLB Draft by the San Francisco Giants. As he entered his minor league career, he led the AA Eastern League in ERA in 2016 and was added to the Giants' 40-man roster following the 2017 season. He made his MLB debut on April 10, 2018. This year, he made the Giants' opening day roster out of spring training, and he started the season pitching out of the bullpen. Please welcome to the show, Tyler Beatty. Tyler, this is incredibly overdue. Thank you for joining the show. <laughs> you got it, DC. Yeah, great to finally be on with you, man. Yeah, so we, we go all the way back. I want to say it's 2008, your, your sophomore year of, uh, of high school. Yeah. And I, I learned a lot about long-term athletic development by going through the high school years with you and, and with your with your mom and dad, your brother and all that. So yeah. um, 
I, I kind of need to set the stage. All right. So it's, it's fall of 2008, you're a sophomore in high school. And I just think, remember you roll in, you're probably six, one at that point, you were, you were, you were tall, but you were, you kind of turned sideways and skit disappeared. You were a little skinny. <laughs> I simply remember it being in the middle of football season. I think your whole team had, had gotten Mohawks and you were, you were kind of like two or three weeks out. So it was in that awkward stage where it was partially grown back in. So almost like you had like football helmet head, um, but your dad brought you in to get started. And um, you had to be thinking like, what the heck am I doing here? Cause you were at the time still a three sport athlete it was kind of in the middle of football season on like some weeknight. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what was going through your head in that moment. Yeah, I think I remember it was like Rich Edmond who had recommended it to us, recommended your facility and yourself to us. And so, yeah, it was like after long days, obviously school, football, we roll in at night and it's this, it's this really cool environment. But I remember foam rolling with, with Chris Howard and then kind of getting into the mix and just being slightly overwhelmed and especially – just extremely sore after the first few weeks because I had never really lifted in that capacity. And, um, but I knew it, I could just tell like the convictions that I had, it was the right place to be. And so that's why I kind of made that a priority at that point. And then, you know, that was when I set aside basketball. I stopped playing basketball yeah. that year because I saw the importance in the fall of coming and training with you before baseball season. I, I always joke that sometimes you, you got to give the, the puppy the peanut butter to get him to take its pill. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I'm sure there was a little bit of that because, you know, to be honest, what was very interesting that a lot of people don't appreciate is I just think you remember, you know, a conversation. I think there was even like a, a follow up email that your dad sent me after your first office. He was, you know, super appreciative of, yeah. you know, not just like the physical improvements, but it was like it was the character building. It was, you know, being around pro guys, you know, Sahil Bloom was a Twitter sensation, former Stanford <laughs> you know, baseball star. Um, you know, Sahil was kind of like a couple years older than you. So in a lot of ways, it pushed out like the opportunity to roll the wrong crowd, make bad decisions, whatever it you know, is that teenagers do. Yeah. Um, so do you think that was kind of like part of it is that it wasn't just about the training. It was more about like who you were around, um, you know, the, the habits that it formed just because you, you kind of had to just keep up with the guys that were doing it alongside you. Yeah, I think that that was a huge aspect of it. And I was fortunate, I think, to have a little bit of that being around some of my dad's college teams at, at Becker when he was coaching, I could see kind of the tendencies that those college players had. And to me, those guys were like major league baseball players, even though they were division three guys. And then, you know, getting to go to your facility and being around actual professional athletes and high level college players and, you know, Euclid is there, those kinds of guys. I just, it was, it was my dream from a, a young age. And then to kind of see those guys living it out, see their work ethic, their tendencies, their habits, the things that they sacrificed. It just gave me uh, an, a firsthand example. And then obviously the training that went alongside of it was uh, just kind of kind of completed the whole thing for me. So it was a special place. I wanted to be there every hour of the day, you know, and I think I tried to prioritize that best I could. I was going to say there were days where you were there till close. I remember you had yeah. a cafeteria in the building and was, yep, uh, me, and, me and Timmy just eating loaves of bread or a rab or whatever it is. You know, it was a fun place to be, man. Talk, talk to me. I, I think the the sequencing throughout your your high school career was a really important collection of lessons. So maybe just outline who you were as a pitcher. You know, kind of freshman, sophomore, junior year. Because I think there's this this remarkable perception that like first rounders are just born. And that, you know, they're, they're always there, you know, they roll out of bed and they throw a hundred when they're 15 and, and everyone mm -hmm. else is destined for a life of mediocrity. Like talk to me about the hills and the valleys that happened like over the course of those years, both from a velocity development, physical development, pitch design, all that stuff. Yeah. So I think, I think it all happened uh, sequentially over the years. So I think my, my freshman and sophomore year when I was at Auburn high school, and I initially started to come to you. I, I was a guy who I, I believe I could pitch well. I just couldn't uh, couldn't really generate a ton of velocity, although at the time throwing 80 to 83, 85 was still hard and at, at that level and, and in high school and allowed me to be productive and have a lot of success. And then when I started to come to you was the physical maturation and the velocity development. I started to, to gain three to four miles an hour each of those years. So junior year, as I got through the summer circuit, finally hit. Um, I guess at the end of my sophomore summer, I finally hit 90. 
um, 92 and then went into junior year and, and carried that through uh, eventually kind of my senior year peaking and getting to 95 with the help of, of you and Matt Blake and kind of the velocity development there, integrating some long toss and some weighted balls uh, on top of the strength programming. Um, but I think it was it was those uh, those summer circuits for me, like really just challenging myself to play against elite competitors, guys from different states who I saw were were playing at a high level, were going to get drafted or play, uh, you know, Division One baseball. And so that was a challenge and pushed me to come back to your facility and say, hey, let's go like this. What I did was was good, but not good enough. And, and so it was always a good challenge from you guys to, to push me to get better each of those off seasons or seasons. I think you, you know, the summer between that that sophomore and junior year when you first hit ninety, that was, uh, I think it was crucial from a buy in standpoint. Um, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if you remember, like you went away, started the summer really well, and kind of it tailed off, right? You're living in yep. hotels on the road, you're not sleeping in your own bed, you're not eating mom's cooking, all that stuff. Yep. And I just think remember there was like a two week period where you came back, and it was just like between tournaments, whatever it was, yeah. ate like a you know a champ, trained yeah. hard for two. And you went back out and that was like 90 the first time. And yeah. it, it was almost like an immediate feedback. And you know, to be honest, this is something I've seen in like pro golfers, pro tennis players. They play like this year-round world and they they get these like blocks of training for a week here and there. And it actually can do quite a bit just to normalize you, whether it's the, the sleep schedule or you know, quality food or just consistency, yeah. whatever it is. Um, you know, I, I think for you, we also learned that there was kind of a, a pretty linear relationship between body weight and velocity, right? At, at 185, you were an 88 to 90 guy. At 205, you were a, a 93 plus guy. Um, when was it that you started to pick up on that? Yeah, I think it, it was that sophomore year, that that two week period where I did come in a little down in weight, a little down in strength and um, recovery or whatever it may have been. And I, yeah, like you said, I think I just, I committed to those two weeks there. I ate well and I went back maybe five or five or 10 pounds a little heavier and, and, and pitch well. But I think it was, um, you know, as I got to Lawrence Academy and I had access to the the cafeteria and I was able to kind of eat as much as I, I wanted to eat throughout the day, um, uh, put on some weight and just just mess around with different weights that I've that I've had over the years. And even in the college, experiencing that, too, and and pro ball messing with throwing at a lighter weight, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, yeah. But I've, I've I've dabbled and I've, I've yo yoed with some diet stuff and some weights and um to your point, it's always the the over the 210 to 205 now that that I, I feel my best. I don't feel sluggish and I'm able to still be explosive and still generate velocity. Yeah, I, I think there's also this perspective that like first rounders don't go through failure, right? That they don't struggle <laughs> with it. And, and the one I, we've talked about this a bunch over the years. I mean, uh, you know, you you were cut from Team USA. And, and I, I actually tell this joke like I've been in that room. I was with the 1800 national team in 2015 and yeah. You know, we, we have a guy with us in the Yankees, Ben Rorbet, who we cut from that room. Uh, Alex Kirilov was cut from that room. He, I think he went 14th overall to the Twins. Yeah. And, and when you're actually cutting guys, they're like, hey, we, we cut Mike Trout from this team, like when he was a, a rising senior in high school. So it's yeah. it's the top 20 players in the country. But I distinctly remember you came back from that experiment, experience. It was summer of 2010. Yeah. And you were a different dude for that 2010 to 2011 offseason. Like, talk to me about – how it impacted you and, and what it changed about your behaviors. Yeah, I mean, there's no telling if I were to have made that team, what it would have done to my motivation or my drive or my work ethic. You know, I, I could have probably made that team and and kind of settled and been content with what I was doing at that time. Um, and what I was doing was good. You know, I pitched well and I thought I, I deserved at least a shot to play with those guys. And I totally get the decision, but it fired me up. You know, it did light a, a, light a fire under me, put a chip on my shoulder. Um, as did some other uh, some other experiences in summer ball playing with guys and kind of getting some limited action and um, really feeling as if I really needed to take my game to a different level. And those experiences were so good for me. You know, I came back and understood the challenge. You know, it was one of those where it's like, OK, you can either, you know, get kicked and stay down or you can get back up and you can get better, better because of it. Um, and I'm thankful that it gave me that perspective and that drive. And then obviously thankful that I had the resources in order to get better um, and, and make the adjustments that I needed to, to, to propel myself into a better position the following year. And you, um, you're an interesting one because you were a, a, a three sport athlete as a freshman, yeah. you stepped away from basketball as a sophomore, and then went baseball only as a junior. And what, what 
is an interesting part of that story that nobody would expect is you came back from that summer and played football at Lawrence Academy. And I, I want to say you were a long snapper and a receiver. Yeah, I was. Yeah. So, and, and the crazy thing, yeah. And the crazy thing was like, that was my, the junior, my junior year was my first year dealing with like any arm pain, any kind of fatigue that was just n- like not normal to me. Um, and it, what's funny is the outlier was like, I didn't play football my junior year, you know? And that was like my biggest priority going back my senior year was like, get a football in my hand for a few months, be competitive, like go try to like tackle dudes and just have fun. And um, that helped a ton, I think for my senior year to help me play with some freedom going into the draft. Like they probably built some, I mean, there are a lot of those guys that were on that football team were on your, your baseball team in the spring. Politanos and Bukowski's like <laughs> yeah a moment of camaraderie I think that emerged from it as well big time oh man it was huge and I, I convinced a couple of football guys to come play baseball because I you know committed to playing football with them and it, it made it for a much more fun senior year with those with that group of guys yeah that was a blast so the spring season rolled around you guys were, you guys were part of a I mean it was an undefeated team it was a, a special kind of scenario and you know I always remember like the last game against BBNN right you're, you're facing yeah. some pretty good players on their side and you were 94, 96 and, you know, swung it pretty good in that game. But everyone thinks yeah. about like kind of the pinnacle of the year with, you know, 50 scouts in attendance. I, I actually think about like the, like the, the bottom end of it. Like I can distinctly remember a game when uh, I actually got there a little bit late and I walked in as you were legging out a triple on a, on a field with no fence. Right. And yeah. I don't know if it was that or if it was just a down day or whatever. And that was a game when you were like 89, 91 and people yeah. were freaking out. And yeah. I wanted to be like this kid. I, I think you were were you seventeen at the time? Because you're a late birthday. I was seventeen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and so it's like we're expecting seventeen year old kids to repeat their mechanics at the highest level in front of fifty scouts every time they come out. It's like sometimes guys just don't feel great. It's not yeah. their rope. It's not fun. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. You have those days. I remember that distinctly, and I remember my dad almost like being. You know, uh, he was in my corner, but he was almost like, hey, you know, what's what's going on today? How's it feeling? I'm like, you know, you just have those days. You know, it's like maybe I had an exam that that week or late night studying. And um, yeah, maybe it was just one of the yeah, I had to open up the game. Like, you know, it's just, sometimes the things just uh, just just aren't there clicking. You don't feel super explosive that day, but you got to compete and get outs regardless. And I think that was the byproduct of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the take home there is like, don't put too much pressure on yourself if you're a teenager. Like, you, you shouldn't exactly. put too much pressure on yourself if you're 22, 24. Like, even the best pitchers on the planet have a couple of clunkers every year. It's, it's hard <laughs> exactly. To really excellent. Um, so, so, big picture, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually really curious. Like, what were the big things you, know, you, you went 21st overall in that draft? When you look back at like that, you know, that that process, and it, it wasn't just senior year, it was many years building up to that. It was going to the field with your dad, it was, you know, being around the game and hanging out with pro guys, you know, aggressive cash play with Blake in the cage. What yeah. were the things that you look back at that were key for you, you know, at a young age to to eventually develop in your first career? What differentiated you from other kids who were athletic and worked hard but didn't necessarily make it? Yeah, I mean, there's so many, there's so many aspects of it, I think. You know, I think it's the the key to challenging yourself. I think for me, I look at the things that I did to challenge myself in competition, going to play against better players in better states, um, better tournaments, just fortunate to be put on teams that I could challenge myself with. Um, And then the environment, the challenge of the environment, being around guys at at CSP who pushed me to not just kind of settle and be content with where I was at to, to challenge myself in growth. Um, and then sacrifices. I felt like I had to make, there was a lot of decisions that I had to make as a teenager to choose to go to go to your facility instead of going home after football practice or going to play summer ball instead of staying home and, and going out with the crowd and kind of being a kid. And, and though I missed out on some of those opportunities, it, it eventually put me in a position to develop better and um, to, to potentially get drafted the way I did. So, um, you know, and I think it, it all just came down to taking each challenge and adversity, like you said, it wasn't like I had a, a success at every turn in high school, um, but just the way that I perceived and and handled those adversities and turned them into motivation. Um, mm-hmm. I think that was, was massive for me and the growth that I had uh, in high school. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, fast forwarding, I guess, three months. Uh, you turned yeah. out a lot of to attend Vanderbilt. I remember uh, probably an 11.57 PM text message, uh, yes. you know, that, that night, 
Um, and it obviously worked out well. You, you guys won a national championship. You got a great education. You were a first rounder again, but that doesn't mean it was an easy process, right? It's a big decision to make at that that young an age. Talking about the, the challenges you faced, it was one of those things where I was, it's almost like hard to even talk to you about it during those couple of years, just because right. you're going the grind of like, holy crap, did I make the right decision? Yeah. It, it's very easy to talk about. It. I'm actually excited to learn, like, what, what were the, the things that you dealt with and, and what did you learn through that entire process? Man, so much. You know, it, there were a lot of challenges. That first year I got my teeth kicked in, um, both on the field, in the classroom, the college experience. You know, I did feel as if I was prepared for it because Lawrence Academy did have this college atmosphere in a sense of kind of living away from home and having difficult classes. And But you get to campus and, you know, time management gets challenged right away. You know, I don't have football to play in the fall. I have baseball, which was the first time I really ever played uh, a full fall of baseball. And so that took a toll on me. I think that was one of the immediate challenges was adjusting to a full season of baseball. Yeah. Um, so that was difficult. And then handling classes and practice and, and sort of that time management aspect on top of it. And then going to play against pitch against some of the best teams in college baseball right away my freshman year and get my teeth kicked in. I, I got humbled. You know, I think I went in with high expectations and I was a first rounder. And I, I think a lot of people expected a lot from me. And um, I just I wasn't performing the way that I needed to perform. And I had put a lot of pressure on myself. Yeah, it's a big put target. a lot of pressure on myself, you know, and uh, and and I and I had a lot of adversity. And then the best thing that I did that year was I took the summer off. I came back to CSP. Uh, I put my head down. Um, I kind of uh, re reorganized my my life, my routines, my my habits. Got everything back in order, and um, it was was fired up for sophomore year and had a, and had a great year that year. But I think like overall, I just put too much pressure on myself to live up to a certain expectation. Um, and I got sidetracked with a lot of different goals and different mindsets and, um, really ultimately like the culmination of sophomore year and pitching as well as I did that year was just kind of getting back to being myself and letting those kind of distractions go to the wayside. You know, social media was kind of becoming a thing that year, Twitter. And so I could read a lot, I could read a lot about what people were saying about me after that. And I had a lot of close friends who weren't necessarily close friends after that because of kind of turning down a lot of money and. It was difficult. You know, I, I do feel like, you know, at that time, I, I think we, we could all agree, like I, I felt ready for pro baseball and, and the, the situation that unfolded was a little unique and kind of dealing with the business side of baseball for the first time was was um, was eye opening and, and humbling and, and difficult, too. And so um, I was so fortunate that Vanderbilt was an opportunity that I could could learn to grow and become uh, myself and grow as a leader and, and uh, grow my character on the baseball field um it, it was incredible but it was difficult those first few years for sure the, you mentioned the social media and it kind of was rolling into my my next question is like you know you forget like you're you're accessible to the world like if you put yourself yeah. out there, and that was blue jays fans who were chirping you and um you know and certainly like you can go on instagram you know, you know this is 2012 i don't know what instagram was <laughs> back then, but you can yeah. go and see your buddies like you had several of them who signed that year out, out of high school and you know, yeah. went on and were, were living their dream. It's like, it's easy to play, you know, try to keep up with them and, you know, only see the good. You're, you're, they're not posting videos of the nine hour bus rides and things like that. <laughs> yeah. It, as you look back, would you, would you have just gotten the heck off of social media? Like, you know, during yeah. that time? That's like the one thing that I, that I've done now that I wish I would have done then and, and had the hindsight to do it. Yeah. To get off social media. I mean, yeah. you know, the comparison game and I, I feel more mentally stable at this point in my life, but even now I feel as if being on social media isn't healthy. Um, just understanding the, like you said, the availability for people to say anything that they want to say. And um, even the, the idea of like comparing yourself to others, even now it's, it never ends in a sense. Like even now that I'm in the big leagues, I can compare myself to another big leaguer and what they're doing and, and not feel adequate or whatever it may be. So um, yeah, social media can be used for a ton of good things, but it, and at the same time yeah. it can tear down a lot of young kids who aren't, who aren't prepared for it yeah i think there's there's three ends to it right there's how well do you let or how much do you let the stressor into your world yeah. like what is the actual stressor and then at the end of the spectrum like you know how do you respond to it and, and for some people the solution is just don't allow it in like yep. separate things you, know, you hear about guys that go off the grid in the off season and that's what works for them so yeah uh, I think it's a valid point that a lot of young kids haven't thought through and you got thrown into that fire when social media was new and you obviously had one of the more extreme circumstances you had to deal with yeah um, no so obviously Vanderbilt works out well uh 
you talk about being challenged in different ways when you got there. Um, I actually remember a joke with, with Derek Johnson because you had DJ your first year there when you and Rav came back just like absolutely hanging at Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah. Clearly like this, holy crap, what did we get ourselves into? Talk, yeah. talk to me about what that first year was. Like obviously DJ built some really significant work capacity. He challenged the guys and weeded out who who didn't belong. Drew Hagen, um, actually interviewing for the podcast later today, was in that yeah. crew as well. But like, talk to me about what happened in that first year. Cause you guys were both very different people um, after that. Rab in particular, like the delivery was much improved and all that. What, what changed for you? Yeah, I think there were so many things that we had access to in terms of the resources from DJ. Um, you know, and there were a lot of new implements, a lot of similar implements with long toss and just intent. Um, I think the volume just early on for me was was new and I didn't that was the first time I really had to to, to understand that building up like the progression of it in, in college uh, in that fall, like needed to be a little bit slower. I think I got so excited so early on on campus that I tried to pretty much throw as hard as I could from day one yeah. um, and I needed to learn to take a step back. And so uh, that kind of came back to, to bite me in the butt there because. You know, I kind of started behind the eight ball, started to have some shoulder fatigue um, and just develop some soreness that really became some discomfort and pain that I tried to throw through that holy first year. Um, and I just needed to to understand maybe at that point was to like, OK, take a step back. Don't rush this like you don't need to push through certain discomfort and, and pain just because you you know, you feel like you need to pitch your freshman year. And so thankfully it took until, until the summer to, for me to say that. But um, those, those are some of the early challenges that uh, really kind of woke me up to, to to the progression and the volume that I needed to control early on in the progression. You, you learned a lot, obviously, during your time at Vanderbilt, had your, had your ups and your downs. And yeah. what, what I'm curious about is when you first got to pro ball, you know, you go from being, you know, one of you know 15 guys on a college pitching staff, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. to going yeah. like, you know, you're, you're, you're one cattle, one cow on a, on a cattle ranch, right? Like there's just tons and tons of people in every major league organization. And there were some adjustments that, that happened like the second you got drafted. Um, and there, there were a couple of years there. It was like 2014, 2016, where you were kind of searching for it. And then 2016, you led double A and ERA. You had a great year. Talk to me about like, what were the things that, what were the adjustments that didn't work? What were the corrections? I know you went back to like your old curveball that year, like, Talk to yep. me about like what you did to to you know kind of I guess reclaim the first rounder status. Yeah, I mean I think like I got into pro ball. It was similar to, to first year in college in a sense of like information overload. Like you, I got so much information. They're they're coming off a World Series, obviously three of the last like five years, and so this this pitching development group like they 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 know what they're doing. And I think for me, I just put so much trust, which isn't a bad thing in every everything that they were saying and suggesting and, and all the information that they gave me to where i didn't necessarily um process it on my own i just kind of committed to it and so I, I really you know i deviated from being like a, a four seam hard throwing four seam guy to like a sinker cutter guy my first year and even though it got me over the plate a little bit more i lost a lot of velo um it was was just pitching unlike the way that i, I had been pitching my whole life um and then 2016 sort of reclaiming that and it was it was just the byproduct of of simplifying the voices around me I, I did trust a lot of people in that organization but i ultimately you know you're your best pitching coach in a sense so you need to be able to know what works for you be convicted in that and and for me getting back to that in 2016 really propelled me for a few years to to kind of pitch in a, in a more dominant fashion and, and be like you said kind of the first rounder that they drafted and and to get me through double a into triple a and so um yeah, I think it was all about just getting back to being myself, uh, simplifying the game, simplifying the voices around me, um, and kind of getting back to – I put some weight on that year too, so there's a lot of intangibles to it, but simplifying for sure. What were the, what were the biggest adjustments? Obviously, AA, you kind of like sorted out who you were as a pitcher, and then you go AAA, you go to the big leagues. Like, What were the biggest um, – you know, you always hear different people have different perspectives on like where the hardest adjustment was. Was was it for you going AAA to the big leagues? Where where was baseball, you know, the biggest surprise to you that the, the challenges increased? That's a good that's a good question. I, it's hard for me not to say AAA just because the PCL for me was such a big adjustment. Like learning to pitch in high altitude, uh, learning to pitch uh, deep into games when you're giving up four or five runs and still keeping your composure and um, trying to to 
to make to put together competitive outings. Um, but then, yeah, getting to the big leagues. I mean, the, just the approach grows. Um, you need to be more um, understanding of the lineup and the guys that you're facing throughout um, from AAA to the big leagues. Um, but I think for me, the game almost got a little bit more simple when I got to the big leagues, just in regards to just attack, you know, attack guys. You know, it almost seemed like it. They made it a little bit more tricky when you got to AAA um, of of these reports and how to attack guys. And then when you get to the big leagues, like, hey, get strike one, get strike two, and, and make a competitive pitch O two, and pitch to your strengths. At least that's for me what's what's allowed me to have success in a sense. Um, and so, you know, I think I think getting out of the PCL was was awesome was awesome too. I, I don't ever I don't ever love being in the PCL. I don't think anybody's ever enjoyed their time in the PCL in the history of baseball. Wonderful no. cities, very wonderful ballparks, or jet streams, or or air quality. I guess in the context <laughs> of being very and allowing a lot of home runs to happen. Um, exactly. But we, we touched on on uh, pitch design, and I don't know if there's a pitch design conversation, but from the day I met you, you've had a really high level change up, right? You got some like you know, kind of freaky long fingers, I'm sure that play into that as well. But over the years, I've, I've seen you pitch backwards, right? Where you've actually pushed off your change up because it's, yeah. it's such a comfortable thing for you. And more probably significantly, I've seen you just like have conversations with kids about it. And, you know, it's just how the ball feels free and easy in your hands. Like yeah. for you, like, how did you get that? You know, I know dad emphasized it really hard, you know, at a young age. What were the yeah. key competencies with the change up? What do you like to feel? How do you teach it to others? What's worked, not worked for you over the years? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the, been the most consistent pitch for me since I was really since I was 14, 13, 14 years old. You know, obviously from my dad, from Lenny Seleski, lessons with him taught me how to kind of hold it like an egg, you know, nice and loose in my hand um, and then throw it like my fastball. Obviously, that that selling point of like throwing everything like your fastball is huge. But for me, I've always had that. I've always had the feel of it. Um, for me, I, I, I grip it like. I grip it. I put my middle finger between the two seams on the fastball, um, and I, I kind of keep my middle finger off the ball a little bit, hold it pretty loose. So it almost turns into a little bit of a split change. I don't ever try to throw like the inside of the baseball or throw the circle or whatever people teach. I just try to throw it to me in my head, like I'm throwing a, like a down and away fastball yeah. or an outside fastball. Um, it's just always a felt good. I never feel seams on it either. I know a lot of people try to feel a certain seam and pull on a certain seam to me that's that's never been effective um i've never i've never changed my grip and though i've tried to mess around with like a four seam change up because i throw four seam fastballs mostly i just have never been able to get as much feel for it as the, the two seam change up that i have um yeah I, when, the way i teach it is uh it is always based on I guess I, I try to take guys away from the mindset of like throwing the circle or, or trying to make it spin a certain way, maybe like a Devin Williams uh, or even watching Scherzer throw last night, the way kind of he tries to spin it too. I try to get him first to think like fastball, hand position, wrist position, and then long toss with it. The biggest thing that I tell guys is to get out past 75, 90 feet even because the proper reception of any pitch when you're throwing at that point gets, gets a little bit better. Um, and so to me, that's always helped. If I ever have any issues with the feel of the changeup, I get past 90 feet, start long tossing with it. It gets my extension back, gets my feel back. And then I'm able to kind of get after it on the mound with a little bit better. So it's interesting. you mentioned Scherzer and Max has used the analogy of like, think about like putting the handcuffs on somebody like you're trying to yeah. almost get on the baseball into pronation and you're, you're the opposite. It's, it's <laughs> press the grip and throw the crap out of it. Yeah, I mean, that'll happen naturally. And I noticed that like when you watch the edgertronic cameras and you watch how your hand, uh, you know, uh, pronates through the ball like that happens for me. Like I ultimately get like um, maybe it's the, the three o'clock hand position like and, yeah. and it happens like that. Right. But uh, in my head, if I think that then I'm going to like push the ball or get way inside of it and I'm, I'm going to lose it um, kind of off the plate to a lefty. So. I like that thought and I've messed around with it, but it's one of those things where it's like, I've almost had to go back to just how I learned it as a 13, 14 year old. And that's, that's worked for me all through these years. So I've been, I've been grateful for that. Speaking of Scherzer, like one of the Scherzerisms that Max taught me was like, you know, with the, in the context of breaking balls, try to learn one breaking ball before you learn two. Right. He, I remember mm -hmm. talking to Justin and thinking about that many years ago. You had, you at times would take your change up like at Vanderbilt and like I remember online they were calling it a cutter and it's like no I'm just cutting my change up like you could do different things with it like yeah. is that a 
eel thing? Is it a mechanical reposition of what you do with that middle finger? Like when, when it is running versus cutting? Yeah. It's, so it's middle finger for sure. Just, so if I'm, if my middle finger is splitting the two seam, it's, it's, it, it usually pulls on the left side of the two seam. If I had a ball, that would be super helpful, okay. but I don't. <laughs> um, and so, so essentially like if it's, if it's pulling on like this, this seam usually to create the, the seam effects on it um, to, to just put the middle finger on the other seam on the right side of the two seam. Uh, it won't have as much of the seam effect, so maybe it'll stay straight or it'll be a little bit of a pull. Um, and sometimes it cut, but ultimately it's like that hand position helps or the middle yeah. finger pulling on the other seam for me helps. And I, I'm i not sure what, what Hendrix does, but he has the same yeah. ability in proprioception. Two, two different change-ups. Yeah, two different change -ups. yeah. Totally different grip. So you're just manipulating, it seems like, a finger. That's pretty, Yeah, pretty that's cool. the easiest way for me to do it, yeah. Yeah, many ways to, to get the job done. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, kind of fast forward, you know, you were a, a you know, a, a COVID TJ, right? You had it like right yeah. as the world shut down in 2020 um, and obviously learned a ton of lessons through that process. So, you know, talk about the complexities of, of rehabbing during that period. And, and then maybe we can talk about like some some important lessons that you, you learned after the fact. Yeah, there was a lot. I mean, I, I was home in Houston rehabbing the whole time um, just because the capacity for players to be held with the team or rehab guys, uh, they didn't have the ability. So I was home rehabbing. I had a good crew of guys to, to rehab with in regards to physical therapists. And so I wasn't limited in that respect, but being away from the team for, you know, almost a full, I guess at that point it was 12, 12 months, but um, being away from the team was difficult. That was a challenge in itself. Building up, not feeling super great. Uh, through my first phase of throwing, that was a challenge, but I've heard that that was normal. So I kind of kept pressing on. And then as I kind of got back into, into the mix, getting more intent on bullpens and getting back into live BPs and game action. Um, I think for me, it was almost, uh, you need, uh, for me, the big challenge was like understanding what I was ready for and what I, uh, what I wasn't ready for essentially. So not, understanding the expectations that I should have had on myself versus the expectations that I felt kind of coming from maybe outsiders perspective, uh, outsiders, even in the organization, just like where I should be at a certain time. Um, I think for me, that, that, that really kind of threw me off just a little bit because I started to deviate from my plan, deviate from what was working for me um, in order to expedite the recovery process and to, to be in a certain level before I was ready for it. Um, and so that kind of, for me, my first season back, I stayed in AAA essentially the whole time, just trying to rehab and figure some things out and then ending the year on the 60 day. So I think that the big challenge was knowing when to, to, to push myself in some parts of the process and then when to kind of take my foot off the gas and recover. It was like what we talked about in high school when I was able to take two weeks off to come train and to, to, to kind of uh, reorient some things and to get, to kind of get set up for the rest of the summer. You know, I think when Tommy John guys are coming back, there's an opportunity to, to take a, a two week break and to maybe it's not two weeks, maybe it's a week, maybe it's two or three days and to just have a refresher. I think that's super beneficial for guys that I recommend during Tommy John. Um, and the other thing is it's just like your body takes time to, um, to, to come together and it has its own adaptation process. Like we've talked about with the ligament, um, kind of, kind of forming and settling, settling into the arm. And so for me, it really took almost 20, 22 months in order for it to really feel good again. So there were a lot of challenges, but it's just a, a process that you have to know is your own and it takes your own kind of time timetable. We interrupt this episode with a quick reminder that this podcast is brought to you by Athletic Greens. It's an NSF certified all-in-one superfood supplement with 75 whole food source ingredients designed to support your body's nutritional needs. I use this product daily and a ton of our athletes do as well. Head to athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy and claim my special offer today for 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. I'd encourage you to give it a shot too, especially because of this great offer and because it gives you peace of mind knowing that you're covering all your nutritional bases. Again, that's athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y to get that special offer. We hear about all the really positive outcomes with, with Tommy John in professional baseball. I think one of the things that we overlook is how valuable it is for you to literally just like look across the locker room and find five guys that have had it where you can ask about their experiences. And, and that was something guys didn't have in 2020. You know, you, you basically yeah. 
we're, we're on your own in Houston. And um, I think a lot of those times you have that advice from somebody that's like, hey, you know what, it's, it's, it's not feeling great today. Take an extra day, push it back. And when I look back on, on your situation, I, you know, you're obviously at March, Tommy John. I remember you and me and Schoenberg and Shane had a conversation. It was like late November. Yep. And it was it was hanging. Meister, you know, who had been your surgeon, was like, listen, give it some time. You know, I want to yep. say he told you, take a month off right yep. now. Give some anti-inflammatories. And it was the absolute best thing. Like you gained yep. flexion when you'd been struggling to get it. Your symptoms all went away. But I remember on that call, you were like, hey, you know, I'll just I'll, I'll just throw plyos and all this. I was like, Ty, you're an idiot. Like, yeah. Yeah. don't throw anything. Like, don't right. throw football, don't throw baseball, don't throw pretend baseball, any of that stuff. Yeah. Just like, do this yeah. right so you don't have to do it again. And like, looking back, like, there's always like this, like, hemming and hawing. Like, you think you're different and that you're like, when we, when we talk about ourselves, we're immune to the laws of like <laughs> healing and biomechanics and all these different things. And I just look back on that as like that, that month you took a huge step forward. You know, it was a, it was a big difference. So, um, you can't enough like to players like like being in a lot of discomfort is not normal and i've seen guys that have you know had graphs that never held and they didn't find out until 11 or 12 months because they thought it was normal to push through pain so yeah. um yeah. You know, credit, credit to you for listening to for uh, to us and we yelled at you about it but you know what are, what are your big lessons to like guys that go through it um you know having been through it yourself and taking a little bit longer to, to come back in light of the, the times yeah, I think you made a good point. Like lean on guys who you know in your inner circle or around you who have had Tommy John, who have gone through that process and just listen to kind of the nuggets that they give you about how they felt or certain parts of parts of the process, you know, how they felt during that time or the challenges that they had, because ultimately you can learn a lot from that. But at the end of the day, it is your arm. It's your own individual process and experience and recovery. And your your arms going to adapt differently than mine will or anyone else's. And so it's to lean on those guys around you like yourself, like Shane and Eric, um, to know, you know, what's normal to feel and, and and when maybe you need to shut it down. You know, it's hard because I think like we're talking about, I'm so I was so used to maybe coming up through high school and, and college of pitching through some pain and discomfort that when you're going through a recovery process as serious as Tommy John, that's not the time to push through certain pain. Um, there there is obviously some phases where you're gonna you're gonna throw and it's gonna not feel great, but you need to keep throwing sometimes to break some scar tissue up, but it's to, to kind of be able to listen to your body during those times. And it's an important, it's an important time. You learn a lot about your body, your mechanics, kind of that's a time to revamp some things maybe and to clean up some things more efficiently. So it's a huge 12 months that you can use to, to really propel your career. And so take it seriously because you can change your body, you can change your, your routines and your habits. Um, and you have this really not much other times in your career where you have 12 month period of of really fully working on things off the field so capitalize on it you um you you i'm gonna i'm gonna ask a question off that but i just want to make a statement so that you're asking a tendon to become a ligament right and <laughs> yeah. when they go and put that tendon in your arm they also crank it crazy tight because the last thing they want is for their their you know their reconstruction to fail so that creates two levels of complexity one the the, the tendon actually has to take on the properties of a ligament and you know it's generally kind of agreed upon there's a lot of research in the acl community where, where it happens as well it's like that that's probably 18 months and we know mm -hmm. the average on a tj to previous level is about 14. so a lot of these guys are are pitching with a effectively a weird ligament for for at least four months there but i think the second one that's probably even more important is like that graft is pulled really tight and you go out and you play catch when you're just hanging around the house and playing video games and do whatever it is you do you're not stretching that ligament out at all it doesn't right. get exposed to anything until you start going through higher velocity throwing laying the arm back getting to you know an aggressive ball release and it slowly starts to stretch out and when we see guys get into trouble is they skip steps they push really hard and you know mm -hmm. one overzealous throwing session can set you back three or four weeks just because it hasn't stretched out and you play mm -hmm. yourself up. so it's just yeah. you have to steal a line from Stuart McGill, you, you got to tickle the dragon's tail. Like every day is just a, a, a gradual exposure that progressively builds not only like work capacity in the arm, but also it, it conditions that ligament to be to be ready for the stressor that comes there. But, um, you know, you, you talked about football earlier on, and I know you've gotten back to throwing the football probably more than you ever have, right? And like that's an integral part of it. Talk, what, is, what is throwing the football – you know, how does it relate to what you felt went down with the TJ? And then obviously, how is it part of your prep now? Yeah, I mean, it was like one of the things I, I remember either asking you or asking uh, the team. I was like, how quickly can I throw a football, you know, before I can throw even a baseball? Yeah. Uh, because I just I, I love the 
Uh, I love the feeling that I get from it. Um, I think it, it's a it's a time to warm up the arm. It's a time to keep the arm kind of free and easy, moving it in an athletic way. Um, uh, there's some strengthening involved with it for sure. Um, for me, it's like the 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 proper reception of it, like mechanically knowing that you're sound when you throw a tight spiral. Like you get the immediate feedback, knowing that things are on time, sequenced right. So that way, when I pick up a baseball, I kind of feel as if I'm already fluidly moving, uh, moving athletically. I don't like to be too stagnant when I throw anyway. So it helps me kind of keep moving around and, and be free and easy. And it's a fun thing to mix up the monotony of throwing one yeah. solid, you know, baseball all year. Uh, you can kind of throw different shapes, throw a football, throw tennis ball, throw a, sm- a, you know, a smaller baseball, a softball, really just mixing it up so that you're when you do pick up a baseball, it's not like, oh, here we go again. You know, another baseball. So, um, yeah, keep it fun. Shout, shout out, Big Walt. This is this is definitely your dad's favorite definitely. podcast. So, Walter, what's up? Yeah. Uh, all right. So, uh, shifting gears a little bit, you've made the transition to the bullpen this year. Um, one, one of your first times really doing it, like in a dedicated role. Yeah. I'm like five to seven day rotation. It's kind of a sweet gig. Everything in the world is laid out for you. I remember yeah. Schiller telling you that when you when you sat down with him when you were in high school, we went over to his yeah. office. It's the sweetest gig in professional sports. Bullpen's tough. It's it's yeah. very unpredictable. What have been the big and you're you're a couple of outings deep right now? What have been the biggest adjustments for you as you've transitioned to that role this year? Yeah, I mean it is difficult, and I have so much respect for guys who have been in the bullpen for for however many years they've been down there. I've learned a ton just from like honest conversations with them. I've learned so much. The biggest adjustment obviously is like playing catch at, you know, three hours before the game, sitting around and then really waiting until your name's called to get hot and, and to make 15 to 20 throws and then to go out there and try to get big leaguers out. So that that for me has been the biggest adjustment, still messing around with some of that stuff in the routine, when to warm up throughout the game, being a long guy, essentially my role right now, I try to get hot like in the first few innings and get my body moving, dynamic warm up throw my plyos, um, feel the slope a little bit with just some dry work and then sit around until my name's called. Um, the other thing that I've, I've really learned from these guys is to, um, to kind of control intent. Like if I'm going to play catch really work right up until the point where I feel as if like, I'm going to get some good bullets off and then shut it down. And then same thing with like pregame in the bullpen, like really don't like try, don't try to get 30, 30 pitches off, get 15 to 25, and as soon as you feel like you're really going to get after it, kind of just control that intent, save that for the game. But the challenge is just that routine and timing and figuring out how much I need to get ready for that game. Yeah. I think it, the biggest lesson I've given to guys over the years that I've learned from being around is like, if you wait for the perfect time to do anything, it never comes. Right. Yeah. I lift today. I might throw tonight. You yep. know, do I, I haven't thrown for four days. I need to feel the slope. Do I throw a pen today? And I think, you know, to some degree, some of the research we've had now that like, be honest, like throwing off the mound isn't that much harder on your arm. You know, if, if intensity is matched, then then throwing off flat ground. So, like, yeah. don't be afraid to feel the slope if you're, you're you're shifting towards getting rusty. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. You know, I, you know, we have a lot of guys who just lift Tuesday, Friday, regardless of circumstance, regardless of game. And yesterday, Tuesday, we had double header, and so it's like guys are still lifting, getting after it, and um, you know, it's just the way that it is. You got to commit to that. You're right. That's an important lesson. And, it's, and honestly, it's super important for like younger kids. Like you're, you're doing this at the highest level where it's like, hey, it's about winning games, it's about you know staying in the big leagues, all these important things. And you're yeah. getting your your developmental work in regardless. And we see so many 16 year old kids like, oh, you know, I, I pitch in three days. I don't want to be sore. And hey, we can adjust the workout really, really easily. But yeah. more, like, who cares if you're sore? Nobody's going to remember the outcome of this game 10 years right. from now. So like, <laughs> exactly. focus on getting better. Yeah. Um, all right, lightning round. This is always a fun time. Um, who do you like to watch in today's game and why? Oh, man. Uh, well, Scherzer, that was awesome that I got to watch him. Well, not awesome because we lost, but uh, great to watch Scherzer, just the way that he attacks. I remember one time he told me, he's like, I have the choice to be 0-2 or 1-2. Like, he has he has a choice. And so watching him pitch, it looks like he is just choosing to be ahead of guys, work ahead. Um, so it's fun to watch that firsthand, for sure. I love that. Favorite teammate of all time and why? You can go any level. Uh, I mean, I can only think of currently, and his name's John Brebbia. He's been a guy who's pitched out of the bullpen for a lot of years. He is yeah. he's hilarious. He makes us laugh. He's one of those guys who's like he's he's so he's so effective when he pitches, but it's like he he has one of those carefree, humorous personalities, makes everyone laugh. And 
one of my favorite guys to be around. As a as Massachusetts well. ties too, I think it's Shirley. Massachusetts guys, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. he's always wearing Sperry's. He's he's a uh, yeah. He dresses like he's from the Cape. <laughs> All right, what's next for you to take the next you know step in your development? What do you need to accomplish to be the guy you want to be in the big leagues? Yeah, consistency around my repertoire and just and just go, go, going and attacking guys. You know, with with all my pitches, I think for me it's determining who I am, especially in this role right now. Owning it, having confidence in that, no matter when I take the ball, no matter the circumstances, and just going out and being myself. I like it. What about advice for a teenage Tyler Beatty? <laughs> we uh, some of it, but let's talk pre-draft Tyler Beatty. Pre-draft Tyler Beatty, uh, man. Don't worry about the opinions of other people take deep breaths and just enjoy the process. Enjoy where you're at because it, it goes quick. <laughs> and this last one I think is going to be a really good one. So um, advice for parents and kids listening to this podcast in the car together on the ride to and from practice games. And I'm going to give some context. Your dad obviously was a super big part of your development. As you alluded to, he's coached um, both yeah. in like the collegiate setting, the private setting. And I know you guys had a lot of these rides together and he's He's actually doing a lot more like write, writing and presenting in this space. And I know it's based on his experience as a coach, but also, you know, things that he dealt with, you know, as he worked through the processes with, with you and your brother, lessons he learned. Like, what, what would you say to, to moms, dads and kids that are, are going to and from games and practices? Yeah, I mean, prioritize being mom and dad over being coach. You know, I think I think that, you know, you get, there's enough of that time where your son, your child is playing where he's getting a lot of coaching and he's getting a lot of input and, and uh, things thrown at him. And it's, it's good for the parents to still provide advice and encouragement and challenge from that perspective and to, to go play catch with them or push them, but ultimately prioritize being parent, you know, that, that kid, the child is a, is an athlete and they want to perform, but they don't need to perform for your approval or your love. So just be a parent, love on them, uh, be there at every turn, no matter if it's a success or a failure, and to know that that's going to pay off for that child more than than any other thing that you do. Um, and I was fortunate to have that from my parents, from my brothers, just support system, even from you guys, no matter what the scenario was in my career, to have people who I could turn to and they would support me and, and be there for me, uh, encourage me at every stop. And so that's uh, an integral part for any any athlete coming up to have in their family dynamic. That's awesome, man. Really good stuff across the board. We hit on a lot of different things. That, this, this might have uh, hit the widest end of the spectrum in the history of 120-plus uh, podcasts. So thank you very much for taking the time. As always, we're, we're cheering you on both in uh, in baseball and in parenthood, which I was yes. to an alley. So best of luck with that. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks, man. EC. You got it, brother. Thanks, man. That was awesome. Appreciate you.